Coming up on Digital Music Trends 222 on the 5th of March 2015, on SoundCloud delivers a $1 million payment to partners, UMG's 2014 revenues decline, is that affecting its attitude towards freemium services, direct to fan platforms, are artists making the most of them, Amanda Palmer on Patreon, and the first South by Southwest 2015 preview. And this week, I'm really happy to introduce a Gramophone as the new sponsor of Digital Music Trends. The Gramophone is a small box that can turn any of your existing speakers into a wireless sound system controlled with your phone directly from the Spotify app. It started out as a successful Kickstarter project, and now it delivers a seamless streaming experience by handing off the stream from your phone to the device, ensuring that you can keep using your phone for, you know, actual calls. And we'll talk about it more in the coming weeks, but for now, check it out on Gramophone. Com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonardi and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and the show can be downloaded as a podcast or either as an audio version or a video version and in case you'd like to take it with you while you're traveling or, or commuting and if you are listening from a streaming or a, a, a radio service on the web you can also subscribe on each of those, you know, if it's Mixcloud or Soundcloud and that way you can stay up to date with what's going on with uh, DMT. If you'd like to receive a weekly mail out please subscribe on bit.ly slash DMT list. And this week on the show, it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, Jesse Scholar, founder of Wixteed Works, a London-based agency specializing in direct fan marketing and retail strategy. So hi, Jesse, and thanks for joining me once again. How is it going? Very well, thank you. It's great to have you. And also a real pleasure to welcome back, always in the early hours of the morning uh, in New York, uh, Benji Rogers uh, to the show, uh, the founder and CEO of Pledge Music, one of the most successful and popular directive fan platforms out there. So hi, Benji, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Thanks for having me. It's great. I'm president now. I'm president now. President, right. I'm president now, yeah. It's good. <laughs> it's a good correction. I've moved positions. <laughs> I, I should always check back on LinkedIn what's going on with, uh, with people's titles. Worry. Yeah. <laughs> and this week, you know, we have quite a few stories to talk about, but I'm most excited to hear about your plans uh, in general and also your plans for South by Southwest, which is coming up shortly. Uh, I, I'm going to miss uh, this one. It would have been my fourth one, but I've got a few people calling in uh, to uh, let me know what's going on uh, during the South by Southwest week. So hopefully I'll be able to provide some yeah, interesting info as to as to the, the latest developments in Austin and uh, launches and all of that. And uh, let's start by talking about SoundCloud this week. So we haven't had uh, much news from SoundCloud uh, in a little while, to be honest. Uh, it's been uh, pretty quiet uh, on their end uh, since the announcement of the on SoundCloud uh, pl- advertising platform. Uh, but this week, uh, the company has revealed that it has paid a million dollars to just over 100 advertising partners within uh, the last six months. Uh, so advertisers include companies uh, such as Grand Marnier, Jaguar, Mountain Dew, and Microsoft. Uh, the adverts have been limited to the US market for now, so this obviously shows sh- shows that uh, the, c- the advertising platform has the potential to expand much further uh, uh, if they uh, release it internationally and open it up to uh, many more uh, premium partners. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a positive uh, indicator uh, to a certain extent, but uh, once again, we have to look at, at that in, in the context of the uh, losses of the company. Th- there were around, around $25 million uh, dollars in 2013, and so it's, it's a long uh, road ahead for SoundCloud to actually uh, be able to build that up uh, to, to uh, you know, become profitable. Obviously, that's, that's the goal of any uh, startup working in this space, uh, although it can take uh, quite a long time. Um, first of all, first, first impressions on this, uh, you know, th- do you think that, uh, Jesse, do you think that SoundCloud can become successful as an uh, advertising-based proposition or will, be, will there be something more that comes, uh, comes after that? Yeah, well, it's the ultimate question. Um, I think that looking at this in the context of YouTube, which is a a sort of a comparable service, I think I read recently, and forgive me if you covered this, I haven't heard if you have, um, I read recently that YouTube was not actually profitable. No, we Um, didn't talk about it yet, actually, no. Right, okay, so that was in the news a week or two ago. Um, And I guess, I don't know, if you can draw a parallel between those services, one would think that YouTube would be turning a profit just right. from looking at it objectively. So I don't know. I guess that shows that there is it's a really there's high barriers to profitability for these companies. Um, it's not a huge payout. It's obviously progress from zero payments to zero partners. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think kudos to to SoundCloud for making the announcement. I'm not sure if they were obliged to do so. No, um, exactly. But yeah, hopefully the numbers continue to go. Yeah, a, a bunch of these companies are not designed to be profitable for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, basically, when you're growing, you'll basically keep taking in more and more investment, get you know very, very 
big and then it becomes very hard for the investors to pull out because they've put so much money in um, and I think also one of the one of the big reasons that um, uh, one of the things that I would that I would read into the SoundCloud issue is essentially they don't have buy-in from the other two majors right. or the larger independents so basically they've got one major which means that any advertising platform is not going to be as attractive if you're not going to have you know um, uh, anything from the um, uh, from the Universal Group or Sony coming through, so you're taking out Beyonce, you're taking out you know uh, a bunch of your 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 heavy yeah. hitters, um, and I think that ultimately what you got to look at too is is that you know SoundCloud's gone for a very aggressive strategy, um, th that can include building huge beautiful offices and doing all those types of things, which means that your burn is very very high. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a strategy that is very, I mean, as we've seen, YouTube, similarly, though, backed by a much, much larger mothership, obviously. Um, uh, again, these aren't necessarily designed to be profitable at these moments. So it's, it's a good thing to watch. Spotify, similarly, taken in hundreds of millions of dollars in investment and, you know, hasn't reached over 20 million paid subscribers. So your cost of acquisition is very, very high early on. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a very sim it's a very familiar concept, you know, um, uh, within it. It's um, one of the things that headlines try to grab is only pays out a million or wow, pays out a million. It's, it's, it's sort of, you know, yeah. um, it depends on what your intention is. If your intention is to pay out 25 million, you paid out a million of it. Well, then you've got 24 million to go. <laughs> yeah. If it's to pay out anything, then that's a good thing. Um, it, it, I teach a, a, a course actually online at Berkeley. And one of the things that's really fascinating is, is they talk about this idea of how do you monetize, you know, how are we going to monetize free music? Um, but as a service, I think you know ultimately, if your if your job is to grow and grow and grow, there has to be uh, an end game, and I think it's going to involve all of the majors. Um, and I think one of the more interesting things to look at is, um, you know, the change up at Universal and Universal's attitude towards that free tier of streaming. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that's one of the biggest uh, hooks in, in that we're going to see into this evolving story. Absolutely, and, and that's sort of a, a natural lead, uh, a, a, a story that we're going to lead into in a second. Uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to sort of ask you as well uh, around this was the fact that it seems like a lot of the partnerships they're making on the advertising side are very bespoke. So this is, they appear to be sort of partnership between an artist and a brand and sort of like a tie-in of, of that kind, of, which, uh, which obviously takes a lot of work uh, from, from all parties involved to, to make it happen. And so uh, on, on that front, do you think that uh, something like that poses challenges uh, as far as scalability is concerned when you actually become the central hub to coordinate all these actions between specific uh, artists or audio uh, you know recording podcasters and and brands and try to tie them together into some sort of uh, so I mean, to me, one of the things that you would look at is, is what's your core competency? Right. Um, uh, you know, if your core competency is to build a remarkable streaming platform that is really beautiful and scalable and the product is fantastic, and then to say, oh, and this other thing that we're really good at is to build massive brand partnerships that span the globe, yeah. those are really hard things. You know, in and of themselves, there are agencies who've been doing nothing but that for a long time. Um, you, you know, I, I, I love the product. I think it's an amazing thing. Um, I, I'm not a, a personally a big fan of this kind of brand uh, uh, the, uh, brand play on the mass scales. It's not my my personal thing. Therefore, I would never claim to be good at it. Yeah. Uh, personally speaking, though, we hired someone. Uh, you know, we hired the, the former brand person from Spotify to come work with us because I do see it as a as a very important entryway into into gaining more exposure for artists and, and that type of thing. But again, it's someone's entire core competency that has to be started. You know, uh, from scratch. And, you know, uh, it's a hard thing to pull off the, the egos involved, let alone the, uh, you know, the, the imagine all the lunches that have to take place and then the dinners <laughs> and the drinks parties. It must be shocking. Um, so, look, look, good, good luck. And, and, hey, it's bringing money in. And that's a great thing. Right. Because yeah, ultimately we want all boats to rise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Jesse, on, on your end, you know, you, you've worked with a lot of uh, on a lot of different projects and you've seen sort of how difficult these things are to, to pull off. Is that a sort of a, a bit of a barrier when you, you need that much staff to actually make this run efficiently? Oh, absolutely. I mean, having staff has got to be an enormous barrier, <laughs> getting them and keeping them and affording them and uh, yeah, 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't have too much to add for that one. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Benjil, I wanted to pick up on, on what you mentioned about Universal Music. So, one of the stories of the week was the fact that you know, UMG announced its uh, revenues uh, for 2014. And uh, they saw a pretty steep drop uh, by 6.7%, which uh, is uh, about 3.8% on constant currency. But it still represents a pretty big blow to a major that is sort of uh, supposed to be leading the, the market in, in that sense. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, the, the, the headline is that they have... Uh, uh, grown uh, streaming revenues exponentially uh, that downloads uh, are stable digital downloads uh, but they th those two figures haven't managed to counter uh, act the continued decline of physical sales and so uh, you know tied to that we've seen the departure recently of the president of global digital business Rob Wells and of David Ring who's uh, was the executive vice president of global digital business and so those two departures kind of uh, as you said, uh, seem to s signal a shift of, of the company towards a, a more uh, subscription-based uh, attitude or, you know, uh, trying to steer away from, from st st uh, freemium uh, uh, yep. services and trying to push those services into making some of the content uh, premium subscriber only to encourage more people to subscribe to it. So, uh, in, uh, under that lens, uh, uh, this also ties into with the SoundCloud story in the sense that it doesn't bode very well if there are only aiming to be an advertising-based platform, but on the other on, on the other hand, you know, how do you think that will affect uh, uh, the way that uh, a major like this behaves towards uh, somebody like Spotify, and, and how that can affect their strategy too? I mean, uh, it's a it's a big question. I've been blessed to know um, you know some of the, those people at Universal, and there's a few others who have departed too. Um, and and basically, you so you have two visions, right? You have a vision where music is basically like water, and it's there's a, a monthly fee that is paid to get it. And where that monthly fee comes from is frankly irrelevant. Right. I don't think it would be a question of if the ad mod model was paying in the same way that the subscription model was paying, I don't think that there would be an issue. Yeah. But I think, you know, certain executives at Universal really feel that, you know, and, and across the majors really feel that if you devalue the product at the by offering it for free, you're also devaluing the digital download, which is true, um, and that everyone should be pulled into a into a paid tier. Yeah. Um I've been frankly surprised at you know, I, I guess what it is is let's really focus in on that that point. Uh, 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 a subscription service's job, right? A streaming service's job is to sell subscriptions yeah. to its customers, not to Universal's customers, not for Universal artists, but to its customers. SoundCloud's job is going to become to sell either subscriptions or advertising or brand partnerships to other people. And those missions are not always aligned with either A, the artist, or B, the label. So what happens is you get a friction. You get a friction whereby if you're a content company and you own a whole bunch of very valuable copyrights, um, then all of a sudden the way in which those are used becomes very, very uh, contentious. And there were certain, I believe, uh, I, I believe that a bunch of people believe in, in the fact that, you know, as Daniel Eck has said, the more people we get into the freemium layer, the more that will convert into paid, the more money that happens. And it's a beautiful theory. The question is, is when you've got 60 million in the free, 12.5 million paid, 2.5 million who spent 99 cents to get into a promotion, yeah. is that necessarily true? And how long? And, and who can handle how long it takes for that for that figure to shake out? Yeah. Um, the thing that, that 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 I always look at is is there's an entire segment of the music buying public who are completely unserved by either the free or the paid subscription. Yeah. Um, you know, 70% of revenue is coming from fans who are completely disenfranchised from that entire world, don't frankly care which service they're getting their music from. You know, the analogy I'll give is, in this office we have Sonos, so there's probably, you know, 10 different subscription services signed up. When Fleetwood Mac's landslide comes on, I don't care which service it is, just played landslide. Like, how hard is this, right? And that's where these ser services come into a problem. They're all competing with each other on, you know, the content's basically the same. Maybe yeah. one doesn't have Taylor Swift, the other does. Maybe one doesn't have Bob Marley, the other does. Maybe 10 of them have Led Zeppelin, one doesn't. Either way, you'll go to YouTube for what you can't find, right? Yeah. So that's the catch-all. Um, but I think that at the executive level, what these guys are, are having to realize is we can't expand and buy more labels because we're the biggest one that there is. We're going to have to figure out how to either sell records or sell subscriptions. But by selling subscriptions, we're giving our power to a third party. Yeah. 
And it's the same bind that artists find themselves in. Oh, no, I've got to pay Facebook to reach my fans. All of a sudden, oh, no, I've got to pay Spotify or RDO or Beats or, you know, whoever it is to reach my fans. And therein lies the bind. It, ultimately, at the bottom of this is a data issue. Um, and to say that freemium is pulling in the paid subscribers, I mean, look at how many hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in streaming thus far yeah. to achieve 15 million, maybe 30 million paid across the entire space. Like, that's a high, heavy cost. And I'm not saying that it won't work. I mean, look, these are high-risk strategies all around, right? Yeah, yeah sure. But... Um, but I, I think that at the executive level, what these guys are realizing is if you're head of digital, you, you, you fall on one side or the other. You fall on free will lead to paid, and I can evidence this by YouTube, by Spotify, by, you know, or, uh, or it won't. And I think that, 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 there's, that there's, it's going to be interesting to see because I don't know. I think it does work in the long run, personally speaking. I think the more free to get out there, the better. Yeah. But I don't have evidence to support that. And I also don't sit on, you know, 47% of all music uh, copyrights. And, and if I did, I might feel <laughs> extremely differently about it. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah absolutely. And, and Jesse, so what is your take on this? And then also, if you want, like, feel free to spin this into... Uh, so sort of what your thoughts are on how this relates to also perhaps the D2C strategy and, 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 or, or D2F and, and how, what kind of role do you think that will play against something like, like uh, you know, uh, the revenues coming in from streaming in the future? Well, I, I think Benji's covered the, the subscription angle um, very eloquently. Thank you, Benji. Um, you're, you're schooling me as we go. Um, as far as direct to fan goes, uh, well, Universal, I mean, speaking of Universal's direct to fan, I know that they are currently facing um, the challenge of pulling together a, a range of, of different um, commerce systems that they're currently that they're using um, and make that into a, a cohesive storefront. I think that's the, right. the angle that they're going for. Um, what, what I was interested in in looking at these figures is that uh, the merchandising and other, other whatever that is, line is showing the, the largest um, decrease, which is down 15% um, from the previous year. And I, I don't know, that hasn't really been touched on at all yeah. um, by, by the, the, the stories that we've looked at. But I, th I think that that's really interesting. And I would wonder if that's because the focus has shifted away from here. I mean... Um, I don't know, Benji would probably disagree with me here, but I feel that uh, the director fan as, a, as an angle, it peaked, uh, it certainly peaked, and, and now it's kind of interesting to see that it's sort of embedded itself into the industry in a way that maybe it isn't quite as exciting as it was. People gave it a try, people didn't really try it out as well as they could have done, and maybe they've moved on from that now. But I'm not sure whether merchandising in that line has any reflection on director fan. You know, Jesse, you raise a, you raise a brilliant point, um, and I'll give you my honest feedback on it. It's because it's been done really badly. Yeah, no, um, I agree. And, and, and what I think has been so fascinating to watch is, um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with, 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 um, with counterparts at, at Universal and at Warner's at Sony, and what's, what's funny is, is they've confused direct-to-consumer with direct-to-fan. Mm -hmm. And what it is, 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 you know, we don't need a global store. That's not what's, what's required. That's what iTunes was, right? iTunes is and was one of the biggest global stores that's ever existed for music in history. And it's about to become a streaming service. Now, we've got to ask why. Why is that happening? And what's really funny is a lot of labels, when, when I would go in and position our company, for example, as a pure direct-to-fan company. We only do direct-to-fan. There is no consumer experience really within what we do at this time, right? Um, uh, they're like, yeah, yeah, but we already have D2C. We have storefronts. That's what we do. You know, we, we, we put shops in websites. And the way that I've always categorized that is if you've got 100 million people that you're trying to sell something to and you're trying to sell them, send them to 100,000 destinations, all of which have their own weird login logic, their own weird URL structure, their own strange store cart logic, then you're, what you're doing is, is you're saying the product itself is what we sell. And the funny thing is, is the products can be had anywhere. And it doesn't really have a value strategically anymore to anybody. You know, um, I've been in this exact same bind. I'll stare at that cart going, do I want to spend two minutes checking out of this damned website to pick up some vinyl that will be sent to me in two weeks from a store elsewhere? You know, it's not a compelling proposition. 
And what I started to realize was that a lot of these direct-to-consumer operations, particularly the bigger ones, were not viewed as profit centers. They were viewed as cost centers. Right. Because when it didn't go well, sending out 800 units where you're making a 10% margin on top is nobody. It's, it's not a business for anybody unless it's your only business. 90% of those revenues were coming from a two-week period before release. So I think that what happened was we, 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 we created a scenario whereby the, la the labels went, okay, don't worry, though, we've got a whole bunch of stores set up, so we're going to have your album available for pre-sale in five different configurations. And I went through, we actually did checkout tests on a whole bunch of direct-to-consumer sites. The average we found was a minute and 45 seconds to two minutes and 20 seconds to check out. Wow. Now look at Amazon who spends $100 million just to improve it by 0.5 of a second. Uh, Kevin, our, our guy here, we work on checkout tests all the time. If you're already OAuth into our site, you can get in and out of there in about 15, 20 seconds with something done out bye-bye. 50 seconds if you're signing up from scratch. Why? Because we created a gl global platform. For and I think ultimately, we don't sell things. We don't sell products. Products are the byproduct of an experience that we offer. And what I think is, is fascinating is, is when you look at the venture capital world, one of the big buzzwords on their lips is music is the most um, sticky, interesting, exciting, invigorating medium that has ever hit this planet, right? And it should be a hundred billion dollar business. And instead, through offering one size fits all consumer strategies, we've halved it from 30 plus billion to 16. Yeah. Right. So, 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 so obviously what it is, is if you're not selling someone something they want, you have to adjust either how it's sold or what it is. And what I fundamentally believe, and I've said this before, is we don't need more ways to buy music. A global store representing only all of Universal Acts doesn't make sense. A global login across all these artists doesn't make sense because it's not the products that people want. It's, it's a deeper connection. And I think that that's really where direct-to-fan and direct-to-consumer differ. Um, you know, I, I presented, you know, th close to three years ago, um, a Nielsen study, you know, at South by Southwest. And Nielsen said there's $2.6 billion a year left on the table because fans can't buy what they want. What did we do? We drove people as fast as we humanly could to freemium streaming services, to websites with shops in them, and then to paid streaming services, to SoundCloud, to YouTube, to Spotify, to iTunes, to Walmart, to Best Buy, to Target, all of which required their own things. Yeah. And what did we send the superfans to? A hundred different channels. We gave all of our logins to Facebook, to Twitter, to Instagram, to YouTube. On, you know, and what's really funny is, right, throughout all of this, our, our physical sales of Pledge grew by 2% last year, right? Our average spend per fan rock solid 61 US dollars per transaction. And we offer products that do not yet exist most of the time. Yeah. So if you can sell something that doesn't exist and you're having trouble selling something that does, <laughs> you've got to ask yourself, what's the more compelling offer? I know that was a tangential thing there, but... I'm, no, I'm no, no, a, absolutely. No, it know. makes a lot of sense. And I think, but I, I think at the same time, you know, Jesse, I, 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 I totally agree with you that there's been sort of like this explosion of excitement around D2, you know, direct to fan and that might have sort of died down as it becomes more of the usual way of doing business. At the same time, it kind of feels a little bit like when you know people it's <laughs> a weird comparison but stick with me uh, when when podcasting first came about and everybody was so excited about it and everybody was uh, you know going crazy uh, uh, you know it's going to be the, the next thing it's going to be the next radio and it, 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 it took another five six years for things to turn around after the excitement died down and for it to actually start to become something that people are like oh actually yeah this is actually going to work uh, it's just taking a, a long time for people to figure it out and to a certain extent you know you look at something like pebble and uh, and the fact that they've uh, come back it's one of the few projects that after achieving the success they've achieved decided to go back to sort of a, a, a crowdfunded component uh, uh, and has managed to galvanize the whole base and, and get you know 15 and a half million dollars in, in 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 just a, a week 10 days uh and and that's sort of like okay, okay it's totally outside of music but it still shows an effect of something that has built up on on a that kind of platform and that can draw back the same fans and to a certain extent that that could apply to music too you know you could have the same fans that go back and and make that next album bigger and better because that amplifying effect becomes bigger and bigger 
And, and if I could just ask one sub question to that too, Jesse, as well, I'm curious to, to get your take on this. Do you think direct to fan has been successfully deployed in the majority of the cases where people say they're doing it versus do you think direct to consumer has been just okay employed? Um, uh, and, and then to do the question about Pebble, because I got a uh, thought on that too. Sure. <laughs> okay, one question at a time. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a really good question about whether it's been successfully deployed. I think that it, it's it peaked, or in terms of uh, well, in my eyes, because I've been very involved in it, and, and you as well, I imagine, Benji. Um, in that there was a lot of covers, magazine covers, and articles, and there was some fantastically successful campaigns done. But I see a lot of people adopting it and I see them adopting it poorly and it always disappoints me when I see a band with a splash page yes. pre-selling their record and they've got maybe half a dozen offers but there's very little differentiation in the price. There's nothing being offered at the high end. They're not really bothering with um, building a database at all. There's just so many obvious components being missed after campaign Jesse, after campaign. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, hey, this is why I have a business, right? Come on, we're trying to fix this. We're trying to show people yeah. how to do it. I'm actually developing um, a workshop series at the moment that I'm running for various clients and conferences this year, building on last year's conferences, which is kind of taking it back to an introduction to direct fan Here are the basic concepts. Here are the building blocks. Let's do this right. You know, if people do it badly, they invest money, they see no return. We all, we all, get, a, we all get a bad name, but really it's just poor execution. It's frustrating. Yeah, agreed. And, right. and to just if I, if I could speak to that the, the Pebble thing, what's interesting is, can you buy a Pebble watch, the new one today, right now? No. Exactly. You're buying something that is yet to exist. So what's more exciting, the thing in your hands, you know, because if you think about it, it's a series of reveals. You know, I, I, I have a Google alert, right? And every time someone says, we're in the studio, I flag it and I sit there and I go to their website and I say, okay, what can I do about that? Nothing, right? Crowdfunding became a multi-billion dollar industry overnight while the industry said, yeah, but it's on iTunes. Yeah, but you can buy it on iTunes for $9.99. In fact, we're going to discount it this week on our web store by 20%. You know, you know what's funny is, is yesterday a friend of mine that I've been trying to convince to do a campaign finally launched it and I paid $70 for a signed vinyl. Do you right. know why? Because I could. <laughs> because I could, right? So hang because on a it was physically possible for me to do so. Does this vinyl exist? No. Does it so have hang to on exist? A no. What you're saying, you're saying is that you're paying for anticipation. Yes, exactly. The enjoyment exactly of wondering it. what it is that's going to arrive is probably outweighing what it's going to feel like to actually have it in your hands, right? You know, I'll give you an example of it, right? Um, one, uh, Nicole, one of our uh, campaign managers, she wrote this amazing blog, which we're going to publish later on. And what's, what's amazing about it is, is she basically talks about it. She's a Beyonce fan. Like, she literally bleeds Beyonce. If you mention, like, we're going to talk to Parkour and Timmy, she's, like, freaking out, right? And she writes campaigns all day long. So she designs, you know, she designed Rufus Wainwright's campaign. She worked on Kay Flay's campaign. So these artists, like, she loves, right? And... She said, what's funny is I get to construct my dream campaigns for all these artists. And when they launch, I, put, I pay between $50 and $70 a time because I want to see Rufus Wayne might do this or I want to blah, blah, blah. And she's like, and on the day that Beyonce gave out her surprise album, I was so excited. I was freaking out. And I spent twelve ninety nine. And she said, that's the only thing I could do. That was yeah. it. There was no other thing I could do. And I said, did you buy concert tickets? Nothing was available. Did you buy vinyl? Mm -hmm. No. And yeah. I said, what's interesting is, is she spent more on three independent artists who offered her something that she still, again, she only got two of the, the things she ordered yeah. last week from months ago, right? And so she got the instant gratification of hearing a Beyonce album, but there's nothing more she could do about it. And think of the frustration of that. So, Mm -hmm. How many people like her would want an engaged, immersive, director fan experience like, like Jesse just outlined? How many people would want to be a part of something bigger than that and are literally not, not able to because 99% of them are being sent to listen to it for free here, mm. put up with a few ads, and then maybe spend $9.99 if you want to cash it to your phone later on. 
Yeah. You know, it's not all about the anticipation. It's about a context and a reason. The reason people are buying the Pebble Watch, they haven't seen it. They don't know what it is. They're looking at a video representation of what will show up, right? Yeah. But they are part of something. They're part of something that they know is going to be cool. This is going to come up against Apple Watch, which is going to launch soon. Think of the, the balls of it, right? The absolute just, you know, what an amazing thing. And so I think that ultimately what artists have done is that they've said, well, no, if we covered that whole direct-to-fan thing by putting up a shop, then that bit's done. We'll scrape up a few things there, but really our outlets, iTunes and Amazon. And to a certain extent, it was the first time, I mean, I'm not a, a close follower of, of Kickstarter campaigns, but uh, it was the first time that, I, in, in a sense, I saw them take a page off uh, what you guys do to a certain extent, because uh, uh, it was the first time that they revealed something that came out and everybody got excited about it. And, and, you know, they raised, you know, 10 million or something like that in, in four days. And then after a few days, they actually revealed something entirely different on top of that same campaign to yep. keep the momentum going and sort of evolved the story of of the campaign as it was running uh, because nobody expected for them to release a, 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 a you know a, the steel version of the pebble at the same time as that campaign everybody thought oh it's going to come out later in the year and so that, that's sort of interesting when we're seeing sort of the evolution of, of the of the storytelling of the campaigns uh, uh, a lot which uh, mm -hmm. which i think is quite yeah. it, it makes it more fun it makes it more more enjoyable uh, yeah. and uh, so um we um, could talk about this for hours and sure yeah we, we could. could we actually could <laughs> uh, but, so, but, but jesse I, I'm, I'm curious like, like, like i mean i mean how do you feel about those types of reveals and how do you you know i mean obviously mm. uh, you know you've run a lot of these campaigns but like let, let, you know, let, let's just be blunt about it, right? iTunes is going to turn into a streaming platform. When it does, the revenue from sales is going to just literally fall off of a cliff. So there's no way to, to kind of counterbalance that unless it doesn't for some reason, right? Unless it just, you know, maintains a different thing. So, I mean, Jesse, what, what's your thought? I mean, where are you seeing this executed well? Where is it, where is it going to compete with that? You know, um, I, I'm very curious to know your thoughts on that. Sorry, yeah. Andrea. But, no, 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 go ahead. You know, yeah, no, I think the the well the the expansion of the the album release day into a broader experience uh, and a broader event is is a really a fantastic development in, in the way that um, albums are being launched occasionally nowadays. Um, I think that there's a fine line to be walked on getting that story right. I think that there are fans who who like you say like your your Beyonce fan who wants more more more, and there are fans who are indifferent i hate to say it but they actually are a little indifferent to everything that goes on in the studio they just tell me when the album's finished i'll throw you some money maybe i'll buy an extra thing you know so there it, it comes down to the individual as always a case-by-case -case basis the narrative has to be carefully constructed um it obviously it has to be authentic uh who is doing this well well clearly there are a lot of artists doing it well on your on your platform pledge mm -hmm. music um, I certainly use that as examples a lot of the time when I'm discussing this uh, with clients. Um, I think what's different and what makes it special about looking uh, to your to pledge music for examples of this kind of thing is that they're all there and available to be searched, whereas in other situations it's all done on an artist-to-fan basis. That's the whole point, right? Direct-to-fan. Right. So they're not necessarily publicized. So we don't see what's going on unless we're on all of those lists. Now, I um, personally uh, am on a lot of lists, a lot, a yeah. lot of lists. And I imagine you are as well, just out of professional curiosity. What, what are these artists doing? How are they using their lists? How are they, how are they getting their fans excited? And people do it in varying ways. I think I haven't, I haven't yeah. been wowed partic particularly by, by an email for a while. Um, I had a great one actually from a, a record label in Australia called, I think it was Social Family Records just a couple of days mm. ago. I don't even know how I got on that list, but I thought the email was great. Basically, it was a it was a it was a query. It was a, a cry for help, or not not really a cry for help, but it was a question going out to all of the the labels, fans, and people on the mailing list saying, "We feel like we might be underserving you. Tell us what it is that you want. Come back to us. Tell us what you think we're doing right." Boom. They're basically asking yeah, question, feedback, yeah. and I thought that's great. You know, that's a that's a model that artists could take up. Yeah. Why aren't we seeing yeah. more of that? Ask the fans and, and, what they want. You know. Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, it's a really strange thing, right? Because in any other business or in any other you know, part of the industry or any industry, if something doesn't work, you don't just keep doing it again and again, expecting different results. I mean, you know, it's, it's a really odd thing. The reason I was asking about that successful deployment is, um, you know, th there, this isn't an either or, right? This is both. You know, um, what's interesting is, is had Beyonce 
you know, involved a whole bunch of her fans in the creation of her album and then literally like dropped it suddenly, it wouldn't have affected the other. Because one of the things is, is and you quite, as you quite much rightly pointed out, Jesse, um, a whole bunch of the fans don't care. Majority of fans don't care about any of that stuff. But I don't care about them. The reason being that they aren't responsible for 70% of all music spending, right? So if you spend half your time trying to reach the people that spend the least, that's a real yeah. low margin game, right? It's yeah. really, really hard to get. What I care about is, is the 34% of the music cons consuming public who spend 70% of all the money because they are the ones that are being underserved and they're the ones yeah. that, that should have those questions come to them. I spend maybe $400 a month on music and I'm blessed to be able to do so, but at the same time, it's literally because I'm able to. Um, when I, you know, I listen to songs to, to, to hear my new music, I listen to um, Tidal as my streaming service, you know, I do participate in that digital economy. So when I discover a new band like Always with two Vs for some reason, right, and I hear the song Marry Me Archie, I love that tune. I'm like, oh my God, this catches bubblegum, it's in my head, or I like the purity ring, push and pull, love this song. But there's no way for me to go any deeper with them. There isn't a, a, a journey I can take. Yeah. So I listen to the song, and then when the playlist shifts, it just kind of goes away, goes right? Away, yeah. Whereas, so instead, it, you know, unless you are go to the band's website and look for their mailing list, so what you're saying is this: the streaming service isn't pushing you to, to take that deeper dive. Is that, exactly. what, is that what I'm hearing? There isn't anything yeah. for me to do it. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that, that's going to be the, the biggest evolution that we see mm, is absolutely. when the streaming services understand that it, they can offer context to why mm. this music should matter. It will create commerce. Context mm. will create commerce, in a, in, in, I believe, in, in the future of the digital economy because it's the only thing that, you, that is uncertain. You don't know the outcome. You're, you're always guessing. There's a reveal. Um, you know, uh, moving, you know, I think subconsciously, as, as, as music listeners and people who use the internet and phones, we understand that the moving of one file to another place is not a huge action uh, because basically it goes, well, music just shows up for me, right? It's a bit like you don't yeah. think about the reservoir that brings you the water. You just turn the tap on, right? So ultimately what goes into the building of the reservoir, what goes into keeping the water clean, none of that is relevant to you as long as your toilet flushes. Um, and as, as, as consumers of music, they go, look, if my Spotify is down, they get pissed off, right? Yeah. Because their tap's off. And I think that there's, again, those are not going to be your high spending customers. Those are your kind of, you know, you're, you're the pieces that you want to get to get famous. But the super fans are the ones that are going to spend the money and invest in your career. And I think that those are one, uh, the ones that are being turned off direct to consumer yeah. uh, and direct to fan because they view putting a website on a shop, uh, on, a, on a, uh, a store on a website as a kind of like, why would I do that? It doesn't make any sense to me. There's no context to it. It's a weird thing to do. Absolutely. And uh, uh, I guess, like, uh, I think we should probably end this section on, on, on talking about sort of direct fan and, and uh, by talking about uh, Amanda Palmer. Uh, I think that's that's uh, uh, probably apt uh, because it was one of the big stories of this week. And, uh, and uh, one of the things that I picked up on it, uh, a lot of the people that listen to the show probably already know all about it. So Amanda Palmer has launched uh, uh, her, her Patreon page, essentially, that uh, will uh, enable her to uh, raise uh, money for uh, each uh, thing, uh, which could be anything from a podcast to a song to a video that she creates uh, 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 for her fans and uh, uh, the fans have already pledged uh, uh, it was a uh, thirteen thousand uh, dollars this morning just 12 hours after this launched uh, per thing that she's gonna that she's gonna release uh, and uh, it, it was interesting because um, uh, I think her blurb around why she was doing it was more interesting than the campaign itself in the sense That's that great. Uh, in the sense that she does talk about uh, the fact that uh, she felt quite a lot of pressure to create a very uh, interesting uh, and to a certain extent gimmick gimmicky things around her releases uh, you know she was like you know I don't want to fill the world with more you know stuff and stuff and stuff and stuff and so w w what can I do in order to sell the music uh, rather than sell the, the mug or sell the you know the t-shirt and so that was sort of like uh, the, the question that I had for you guys was uh, uh, how, how do you feel about the, the pressures that perhaps doing uh, a lot of DTC puts on artists to be super mega creative uh, and that's one that has been ongoing for years now uh, around their campaigns and, and uh, how much you know 
how much scope is there to continue to innovate in that in that department to create really interesting products all the time for every release, uh, considering that you know an artist could have a thirty-year long career. Anybody wants that, Jesse? Jesse, yeah, go for that. I could start go with on, that. On. Uh, I, I think it's a you know I think I think it's an amazing thing for Patreon that Amanda Palmer has stepped on board. Um, I think the platform is really interesting, and I love the fact that it's kind of echoing this patronage system, which has been around since I don't know. I think that was around in like ancient Greek history. They they had that kind of thing happening, right? So fantastic that it's been updated um, for for today's world, um, so that fans and admirers are able to contribute funds and and to sustain an artist uh, to continue to, to produce their art. Obviously, this is going to be, a, um, I think it's going to be a big boost for Patreon. And I, I love the fact that um, in the, the interview, Musicalized interview with uh, Jack Conte, um, he smartly points out that having Amanda on board is going to be a test of the platform. It's definitely going to be uh, a kicking of the tires, as they say. Um, and I think it's a great attitude that, that he says that straight up. And, and I think it points to a really promising future for the service. Uh, particularly with this kind of publicity. But to your point on um, the possible or maybe perceived pressure to continue to produce um, incredible campaigns with every album, I think that uh, Amanda's introduction, which is makes for a really good reading, um, she makes some really great points. She talks about Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter, of course, being the platform that she did her, her massive 1.2 million biggest music um, project ever on Kickstarter um, fundraiser a, a year or two back. Um, she talks about Kickstarter being really great for one-offs, but not appropriate for frequent repetition. Now, I think we can spin out from Kickstarter and look at um, the director fan campaign generally and say, yeah, for sure. Kickstarter, particularly as, as a crowdfunding, the, maybe that you can't just, some people do do them on, you know, over and over. But I think that with such a big one um, as that, it's, it's difficult to replicate. And I know that yeah. I think she went on to do one on Pledge, Benji. Yeah. Um, but I think that she, the point she makes about, she says, I also don't want to have to think up clever merchandise and, and I don't blame her because that, it, it takes a lot of energy to do that and it makes sense to do it around an album by all means. You're creating an album, you can work, create yeah. a whole bunch of products that go with it or, or experiences or, you know, products just seems like such a cold term. Experiences, um, beautiful one-off artisanal pieces, but, um, if you're going to be doing that all of the time, you haven't got any time to be a musician. And essentially, she's a musician, she's a creator. She wants to be doing what she wants to be doing. If she doesn't want to be creating fancy mugs, um, then, you know, completely all power to her. Yeah. Mm. Although so, she does mention making nudie pens, which, if I'm right, are those pens that you tip yep. and something. I think that sounds yep. great, right? That's so Amanda Palmer. I kind of, I'm not really a fan of hers with her music, but I want one of those pens. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I was actually speaking to a Patreon artist, um, an artist that uses Patreon uh, in um, uh, uh, Nashville. And it's really funny. When I spoke to Amanda Palmer at South by Southwest a couple of years ago, we had this conversation about basically going back to the well once you've done a big crowdfunding campaign. Um, and one of the reasons that we that we definitely are not, I don't consider us a crowdfunding platform at all. Um, we do have the ability to fund things, but we don't uh, view in us in that sense, is because when you say to someone, I need $100,000, give it to me, then I'll, I'll go make something. Once you've done that once, you create a well, right? And then when you want to create something else, you have to go back to a well. And one of the interesting things when I said to this, to this guy who was a you know, pretty successful Patreon guy, um, uh, artist, I said to him, you know, so what happens when you want to release an album? Uh, when you want to create an event around the release of an album, you've basically got to keep your Patreon supporters happy by filling them with content, and then you've got to do something else. And, and how do you uh, complement the two? And the conclusion I came to was is he's actually created a year-long well now, right. now, whereby basically you have to continuously feed content into um, uh, uh, a platform because they are now, you know, look, look you know, this, is, is this a $13,000 video? Is this an eleven thousand dollar video? And then what you're having is is you're having a scenario whereby you've got to do that at a consistent basis. We found that the average number of campaign uh, of updates that an artist would do around an album campaign to be successful was seventeen. Right. And what we found was is every single one of those updates led towards and uh, had this beautiful thing. It would launch, level out, and then it would peak as it hit release. 
And so one of the things that I believe is, is that you don't create fundraising campaigns. You don't create endless campaigns that don't stop. You create events that they come up, they level off, they crest, and then they go down again. And then you stop and start again. And what was very interesting to me about, about the whole Patreon model is, you know, I've, I've subscribed to other services where, you know, I will get this content feed. And after getting it, like, you know, once a month, once a week, whatever it is, it kind of becomes overwhelming. Right. How much A material do you have? You know, how much can you literally sit there and do? So I think, I think ironically speaking, um, if you're a YouTube creator and you, you literally all you do is create YouTube videos, then, then it's the perfect platform. You know, um, I think what you do, though, is, is all of a sudden you've created a well whereby you go, now I, just, I can't just put out a video. I got to put out, out a thirteen, fourteen thousand dollar video every time. So you're not, you can't just be like, pick up the phone and say, hey, we're in the studio. Check it out. This is a boom, boom. You got to be like, all right, this is it. And I think that what's going to happen is, Pet patronage ba was based around, you know, the idea that you would basically, you know, a wealthy person would say, here's, you know, X money, create a work, uh, you know, a, a, an exhibition. And they would go away and do that. And it had an end result, right? And you would be able to keep having an end result. Whereas what I think we're going to have is this really interesting conundrum, which is where for the next year, I have to create this level of content yeah, And then if I want to make an album or a piece of art or whatever it is, it's going to go on top of that. And I think there's going to be a very interesting push and pull in it. I'm not saying that, that, it's, that it's not going to be a, a, a part of the future, but we looked at, at adding you know, um, certain elements of this to the pledge platform. And what we realized was what makes a campaign so successful is that it ends. Yeah. Because having it have a finite end means you've got a, a beginning and a destination, and then you get to enjoy the fruits of it for as long as you like. So it's going to be a very interesting thing to watch. Yeah. Um, and I really do applaud her for, you know, she's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And, um, uh, you know, um, uh, but I think, again, there's a moment where you go, all right, let's, let's, Let's make the fifteen thousand dollar video yeah. <laughs> every month. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't know if that's the right way of looking at it, though. You know, I mean, if you sell a record um, and, and you sell, you know, you make say a hundred thousand pounds from make, from a, from a record sales, just to pluck a figure out of the air, people aren't looking at the record and saying, "Hmm, total revenue was a hundred thousand pounds. Is this record really worth a hundred thousand pounds?" It's because they're they thinking, they're not it, thinking Jesse. of it like that. They're thinking it's of it. Because they aren't seeing the money. Whereas, yeah, but just say they heard you, about it. Hang on a yeah, sec. When I'm paying my six pounds for the download or whatever, I'm thinking, cool, I'm going to get six pounds worth of music. It's going to be worth way more than six pounds to me because I'm going to really enjoy it. I'm not thinking about all the other people who've bought it and how much money that pulls to. So I don't know. I think I think the way that you're looking at it is a, is a, can be argued with. I I I'm arguing. I could just I, say, I, I will, Jesse, uh, you're right, and it can be argued with. But the, the other flip side to that to look at would be when that content is delivered to you, you see the financial value beside it. So it is going to force that, that number in your face yeah. every time yeah. in the same way that crowdfunding did. If you got a shitty Pebble watch, you, your immediate thing is, but you raised $10 million. Why is this a shitty watch, right? It should be a good watch. I, I think and, and that, right, but I that, think that's the that reason that I always remove. That's the, why, why we remove all of the financial elements of it to make it solely about the end result and the experience. Well, I, I will I jump. See that. Hang, hang on, Andrea. Sure. I got to argue this point. I can see that, you know, <laughs> that's what makes in. Pledge different is not having that figure. But this is this is a different service. They are choosing to, to display that figure. And I think that that is going to be important to the people who are choosing to be patrons of these artists because if they think that artist is getting paid too much they're free not to pay you know that, 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 yep. that's up to them i think uh, i think that's a really uh, you all made really good points because uh, on the one hand we have the fact that if somebody like amanda palmer didn't want to do a monthly payment system because she didn't want to feel the pressure of having to deliver every month on something at the same time it also means that because it's a charge per thing rather than per month mm -hmm. she won't be able to or she, she, you know she might be able to just release you know a 20 minute podcast or half an hour podcast but people might start looking at the value of that and and say well you know you made fourteen thousand dollars out of having a chat with somebody for 20 minutes is that really worth fourteen thousand dollars and i i think awesome. i take i take i take benji's point on that uh, uh and you know 
you can uh, listeners can also go, go and have a look at uh, patreon.com slash uh, uh, sorry ace uh, d-t-e-c-t ace detect uh, uh, which is uh, the, the host of uh, the Daily Tech News show and they're, they're doing amazing work on Patreon and they're raising uh, uh, fourteen and a half thousand uh, dollars a month uh, on their uh, the tech podcast but it's something that uh, is charged on a monthly basis and comes out every day every working day uh, so uh, in that sense it makes a lot of sense to, to do a monthly charge uh, and yeah but it's going to be interesting and, 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 and just, just to be totally clear like, like like said i think kickstarter is a phenomenal platform for raising money and yeah. i think that patreon is an amazing platform for that type of of artist i think that that again you just got to ask yourself are you that kind of artist absolutely mm-hmm. and and also do you want to make what you do have a very strong financial com- component to it um, because fine, you know, just let's just bear this in mind, right? I think that 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 anyone listening would rather tell a stranger about a bizarre medical condition they have than they would talk about how much money is in their bank, right? <laughs> so finances makes make a lot of people really uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, like if I were to say to you, how much money do you have in your bank account? Very few people will will tell me if you know. So so finances are intensely personal. They money makes people do very strange things, and so when you mix art and money, you have a really dangerous you know like a powder keg, or it goes really well yeah. depending on, on on value, right? Yeah. Um, and so that was one of the things that that, that you know I'm not, it's not a plug for pledge. It's no, just it's that, worth that, bearing There in mind. was a very specific reason we did it was because I know how uncomfortable that money makes people, and certain people don't care, certain people do. But ultimately, we found that it was a more successful model to not make these things about money. That said, if you're creating an ongoing series of content and that's what you're going to do for a living, as certain people do, I think it's a phenomenal platform and yeah. an amazing way to go. I just worry about the upcycle and downcycle that comes with that type of thing. So, uh, well, it was actually a great week to be talking about, uh, uh, you know, everything to do with uh, uh, Directify and direct consumer and crowdfunding because uh, there were actually quite a few stories. So, it was totally random, but it, it was it was fantastic. I'm going to think I'm going to skip on. I, I want to talk about Cobalt and transparency, but I think I'll, I'll save that for next week because it's a story that sort of keeps on giving. And, and there's a lot to talk about around transparency and Cobalt raising a new uh, a round, a substantial round uh, uh, of, 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 of funds. Uh, but I wanted to end the show today by asking you guys about your plans for South by Southwest uh, and I mentioned it at the beginning and also what's going on with, with your respective companies too although we did touch a little bit uh, on that uh, during the show so uh, Jassy you're, ha- you're both heading out I think uh, uh, Jassy what, what, what are your plans uh, right now we're two weeks away uh, what, what's going to happen I'm getting excited is what's happening. Uh, I am preparing for a panel that I'm going to be doing on the Wednesday the 18th at 5 p.m. at the convention center. It's going to be called Mobile Music Geek Out. Uh, It's also featuring Oshin Lenny, Stephen O'Reilly, and Daniel Nathan. And we're going to be covering all things related to music and mobile. So I'm expecting it to be a really great snapshot of this growing area of the industry. Uh, And we'll certainly be talking about mobile in the context of fan engagement and director fans. So yeah, looking forward to that. But otherwise, in the wider um, South by Southwest event, um, you know, I'm just starting, I'm actually at the point right now where I'm getting a little bit freaked out and overwhelmed by just how much is going on. Yeah. As I think a lot of people who are going or who have been will relate. Oh, it's kind absolutely. of overwhelming, you know. It's always the two-week I mean, panic. Yeah, I'm just like, well, there's all these parties I have to RSVP to. I don't even know where a lot of them are. I, I kind of... I don't know, but I am looking forward to the New Zealand party, being a New Zealander myself. That's at Brush Park on Wednesday the 18th, yes. uh, and I'm hoping to get to a lot of panels. This is my third South by Southwest, but it is actually the first time I've had a conference ticket. Oh, nice. <laughs> so I'm planning on making the most of that and, and getting getting some learning in, hopefully, if I'm if I'm moving around early in the day. We'll Absolutely. See. And, and uh, uh, the Eventbrite uh, app is going to be your best friend because... Uh, most of the events are always are, are been on event, event, Eventbrite, and if you have the app, then you, you know sort of yep. what you've done. Eventbrite, and, and hopefully there'll be a lot of free Wi-Fi in, <laughs> yes. in downtown Austin. That's yeah. going to be my very good friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of people that are going from the UK are uh, are either switching to three or getting some sort of three plan because uh, they, they, really? they get free uh, US roaming, so it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> and Benji, on your end, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's going on uh, at South By? What, what are you guys doing? Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, I'm doing um, I'm doing panels um, uh, on direct to fan, and and um, uh, I'm super excited about that. I, it's also the, pl- the the place to meet some of you know like some of the the, the smartest people I know in the world. All show up there, and we we kind of um, uh, you know I'm I'm just 
excited to be in their orbit most of the time <laughs> you know um uh i'm looking forward to seeing a bunch of our bands that are playing down there um uh yeah i it's a real connecting connection point for me um uh you you know i, I normally just camp out in the lobby of the driscoll hotel and, yeah. and uh, kind of see what happens <laughs> see there what happens. there's also a superb coffee shop that opened up a couple blocks away now so so nice. the caffeine's covered and um yeah, I mean, we don't have any formal plans this year. We're just going to go down and uh, and uh, um, meet people and, and see people. I'm very upset that you aren't going to be there, Andrea. I think I know. We, need to, we need to fix this immediately. I know. Uh, well, the, the, law, the law degree has taken uh, has taken over, and so <laughs> I've got my exams in June, so I can't really... Uh, Good I mean, man I, down. Good I could have taken a week off. <laughs> it's just that I didn't have the time to prepare it and and sort of do the post sort of because it takes really yeah. three or four weeks of your time if you go and do it properly it's not just the showing up uh, unfortunately uh, so oh, yeah, yeah that that was sort of the the thinking behind it hey, if i'd shown up i would have been so stressed out it wouldn't have been fun at all uh, yeah. <laughs> to try and do the work as well and uh, and so but no next year hopefully uh, I'll, I'll i'll manage to get down and uh, other than that i also would like to thank our uh, new sponsor and we we've seen the introduction uh, at the beginning uh, which is gramophone which is a fantastic new way to play Spotify uh, and uh, other services coming soon on your existing speakers uh, and uh, uh, you can check that out on gramophone.com thanks so much for their uh, uh, help in making DMT happen and uh, thank you so much for your time guys it was great having you on uh, thank you. and see you very soon I'm sure and thank Jesse, you so much I'll see you at South Bay all right, that'd be great, Benji. And thank you so much for listening. Uh, the Digital Music Andrea. Trans comes out every week uh, on uh, Thursday, usually Thursday night. Uh, and you can find it on digitalmusictrans.com. Have a fantastic week and until next time. Bye.